Welcome back to Harbour Unbox. I've now tested all 10 retail Core i7 8700K processors and it's now time to go over the results. If you missed yesterday's video, then check that out first as it provides a bit more of an explanation of what we're doing here. Basically though, when reviewers like myself checked out the Core i7 8700K for the first time around six months ago now, we were all, or rather most of us were, impressed with the overclocking capabilities. Most reviewers hit 5.1 gigahertz using around 1.35 to 1.4 volts, but reported scorching hot temperatures at this frequency at temperatures that were well into the 90s. Half a dozen reviewers, including myself, pushed things to their limits and managed 5.2 gigahertz. These are obviously very good chips, but again, they did run super hot at that frequency and would require de-litting for long-term usage. Quite a few reviewers though were limited to five gigahertz and well, you could speculate as to why that was. Uh, stuff like they didn't push hard enough, or they were happy with five gigahertz and just stopped there or whatever other story you can come up with. Uh, I'm no pro overclocker though. I've certainly never claimed to be on the channel and for the most part, overclocking doesn't really excite me much these days. Uh, that said, hitting 5.2 gigahertz on my review sample was extremely easy and I did so with very little effort. I'd say most of the reviewers that were limited to 5 gigahertz know at least as much as I do when it comes to overclocking. In fact, I'd say most of them probably enjoy tinkering with this stuff more than I do and possibly have more experience. I guess what I'm saying is if I can do it, I'm confident they can as well and I'm certain they would have. As a side note, I was able to boot into Windows at 5.3 GHz with my sample from Intel, but I wasn't able to complete any tests. I've since spent quite a few hours with a few different high-end motherboards, and despite temperatures remaining quite reasonable, even with dangerous voltages, I haven't been able to stabilize the chip at that frequency. It seems to be able to do 5.2 GHz with ease. 5.3 GHz, though, seems to be just out of reach. Anyway, despite a mixed range of frequencies from reviewers, there's always claims of samples being cherry picked. So I decided to look into this a bit further. Supporting this endeavor is PC Case Gear, who handed over 10 brand new unused Core i7-8700K retail boxes for testing. So I've spent the last three days swapping 8700Ks in and out of the test bed to find the maximum stable frequency each chip is capable of. None of the CPUs in this test have been delitted, including my samples from Intel and ASRock. Uh, for testing, I'm using the Gigabyte Z370 Aorus Gaming 7 motherboard, and for cooling, I have the Thermaltake Pacific R360 D5 liquid cooling kit. For this one, I'm just sticking with basic multiplier overclocking, so no adjustments have been made to the base clock. And in order to validate each overclock, I'm running a Blender workload, which takes the 8700K a little over an hour to complete. So no, it's not a 24 hour extreme stress test. I just don't have over a week to invest in this video right now. Certainly not with second gen Ryzen CPUs knocking. Anyway, this is still a very heavy workload and chances are if it can survive this, it's really good for any gaming session you can throw at it. Okay, so starting with my Intel review sample, which we know is a beast, and I wouldn't for a second argue that this isn't top grade silicon. Using just 1.37 volts in the BIOS, it manages a rock solid 5.2 gigahertz overclock. Under load, hardware info reports it drawing up to 1.392 volts and peaking at 91 degrees, which is obviously very hot, and for prolonged use, you will need to delid this thing. It also pushed total system consumption to 275 watts. Uh, based on an average of six passes, we recorded a multi-threaded Cinebench score of 1,663 points and a Corona benchmark completion time of 122 seconds. In comparison, the sample provided by ASRock, which has a slightly different batch number, isn't quite as good. Although it managed the same 5.2 GHz overclock, it did require more voltage and therefore it did consume more power and ran a tad hotter. Now, time for the first retail chip and this one managed 5.1 GHz at a very reasonable 1.38 volts, which saw the system consume 266 watts under load and maxed out at 88 degrees. In terms of performance, it was very close to the ASRock sample despite being 100 MHz down, though of course we are only talking a 2% reduction in frequency. I was able to load into Windows at 5.2 GHz, but even with 1.425 volts, it wasn't completely stable. Therefore, while not as good as the samples that I got from ASRock and Intel, uh, this retail chip is still very good. Moving on, we have retail chip number two, and we find a very similar result, 5.1 gigahertz, but this chip did require a bit more voltage, and this increased uh, the power consumption and thermals a little further. Uh, this chip wasn't able to even load Windows at 5.2 gigahertz, no matter how much voltage we gave it. 
Then retail chips 3, 4 and 5 were all limited to just 5 GHz with around 1.35 volts. I could have done a bit more voltage tuning here to be honest, but I was mostly focused on the frequency. All three could load windows at 5.1 GHz using 1.425 volts, but stability wasn't 100%. They did appear stable at 1.45 volts, but temperatures were getting well into the 90s, like very high 90s, almost knocking on 100 degrees, and that is with our open loop system. So without a D-lid, these results are unacceptable in my opinion. Opinion. Retail chips 6, 7 and 8 were all much the same, hitting 5.1 GHz, a stable 5.1 GHz, though they did require over 1.4 volts to do that and therefore power consumption and thermal output was quite high. So again, good overclockers, but they're clearly not as good as my QS sample. Finally though, I did have my first real win when I got to chip number 9. This one was very similar to the QS chip provided by ASRock. I managed 5.2 GHz with the V-Core set to 1.4 volts in the BIOS, and performance was identical to that of the chip provided by Intel. That said, the voltage was much higher, and this increased power draw and thermal output quite substantially. Then last, but not least, we have retail chip number 10, and this was another 5.1 GHz chip that required just over 1.4 volts. So, not as good as the QS samples, but still quite a good retail chip. Then wrapping up the testing, just out of interest's sake, I decided to install each CPU again, load the BIOS defaults, and then enable multi-core enhancement as well as XMP. Then I ran the tests again, monitoring things like the frequency, voltages, power consumption, and temperatures. All 12 CPUs hit 4.7 GHz on all cores for both the tests, and performance varied by no more than a single percent, which I'd say is margin of error, even for a six run average. Again, we see that my sample from Intel was a little special, running quite a few degrees cooler than the retail CPUs, uh, despite hitting a similar or even higher maximum V-Core. Uh, maybe the heat spreader on this chip's pressed down a little harder or something. Overall, we had just one of the 10 retail chips that could do 5.2 GHz, six that did 5.1 GHz, and obviously there were three that did 5 GHz, but of course there was nothing worse than that. So. Overall, I was a bit disappointed not to see at least one other chip capable of 5.2 GHz, but I suppose at least we got no lemons. So overall, probably a pretty good result there. Honestly though, the results I found with these 10 retail chips really aren't that different to what the tech media found. In fact, overall I'd say they're actually a little bit better. And while I wouldn't dare say that you're guaranteed 5 GHz, uh, if you were to buy one of these 10 chips, then you would have achieved at least 5 GHz, and well, some reviewers that were given chips by Intel didn't even get that. And we are talking about seasoned, highly experienced tech guys. You know, guys like Steve from Gamers Nexus. I know if I were going to spend loads of time and energy sifting through hundreds, if not thousands of CPUs to find the golden eggs, uh, I'd be sending them to guys that'll get the most out of them. Whatever the case, what these results mean, and well, they are by no means uh, conclusive, but what they should indicate is that uh, you have an extremely good chance of getting an 8700K that will do at least five gigahertz. Of course, even for a five gigahertz overclock, you will require a high-end air cooler or a liquid cooler with at least a 240 millimeter radiator. And for best results, you will need a D-lid. And well, I've given my strong and negative opinion on this subject several times before on the channel. In a nutshell, I find it unacceptable the Intel forces are those who purchase their expensive unlocked CPUs to spend even more money and time de-litting them uh, just so they can achieve acceptable operating temperatures. But that's an entirely different issue, so let's not get into that here. Things to look out for in reviews that include overclocking is stuff like power consumption and thermals when overclocked, as well as take note of the motherboard and cooler used. For my review, I used the extreme and very good MSI Z370 Godlike with a 240mm all-in-one liquid cooler, and I had this to say. With a room temperature of 21 degrees, the 8700K idled at 25 degrees, stressing both the CPU and FPU caused temperatures to hit 84 degrees, while only stressing the CPU saw temperatures max out at 60 degrees. Once overclocked to 5.2 GHz, we reached within 6 degrees of the TJ Maxx while running the CPU stress test, peaking at 97 degrees briefly. Obviously, a D-lid would help tremendously for those seeking extreme overclocks and or a more extreme cooling solution. So, basically what this means, unless you're willing to D-lid the 8700K and couple it with an expensive cooler, you are running over 5 GHz, even if you do win the Silicon Lottery. Whether or not Intel is cherry picking review samples, I, honestly, I still don't know. I got lucky for sure, but there are those that didn't. For me though, the evidence so far probably suggests that they're not, but if you believe they are based on the evidence at hand, then you'd also have to strongly believe that AMD did exactly the same thing with Ryzen.
Whatever the case, it's hardly the biggest con job in the world if they did in fact cherry pick them. Our reviewers mostly showed 5 to 5.1 GHz with a few showing 5.2 GHz. Then based on the evidence in this video, if you were to buy them off the shelf, you'd likely see at least 5 GHz, maybe 5.1 and possibly 5.2. So yeah, big deal about nothing probably. If the average retail CPU did, let's say, 4.7 to 4.8 gigahertz, maybe even 4.9 gigahertz, then sure, that's a bit of a problem. But with 5 gigahertz looking almost guaranteed, assuming you have a good motherboard and cooling, then it's hard to see what all the fuss is about. Finally, as I said earlier, the results from our 10 retail CPUs are by no means conclusive. Uh, we only looked at batch L733, and even then, there's a chance you could get a CPU from this batch that'll only do 4.9 gigahertz, or you could get one that'll do 5.2 gigahertz, or maybe even better. Again, Silicon Lottery. And that is going to do it for this video. Uh, really big thank you to PC Case Gear for supplying all 10 retail 8700K CPUs. Uh, if you enjoyed this video and you appreciate the effort involved in creating it, then please head over to the PC Case Gear website. Or if you're not an Australian, maybe stop by their Facebook page and just give them some love there. You can also support us directly via our Patreon page, and if you do so, you'll gain access to our Discord chat and monthly live stream, and that's with Tim and myself. Uh, we often give our patrons a bit of a sneak peek at what's going on behind the scenes as well, stuff like this very video. Anyway, thank you for watching. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll catch you again very soon for some second-gen Ryzen action. See you then.